The idea of utopia has always fascinated me because I'm always looking to optimize myself. I'm always looking to optimize my community, see how we can work together, whether it's my company or whether it's just a group of friends or whether it's just a singular relationship. Like what's the best way to create that structure? But in these utopian fictions, you actually get to expand that out to what the whole society would look like if they were operating at the highest level of consciousness and efficiency. And there's not a lot of people who have done that well. And the dystopian fiction, I mean, there's a lot of that. There's all kinds of zombie apocalypses and all kinds of Orwellian 1984 scenarios that show us how things could go really bad. And we've had real life examples of some of those situations in various times and various governments and places around the world. But utopian fiction and utopian reality is something that's a lot more scarce. I was first exposed to it by Aldous Huxley in his book, Island. And then when I read Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk, I felt like it elevated some of these incredible ideas and almost took it to another level. And again, the basis of the story for Fifth Sacred Thing, like Aldous Huxley's Island, is the clash between the utopian society and then the other dystopian society which has a lot of resonance with a lot of things that we can see in our current society. And actually both, to be fair, now in our day and age and in our time, we can really see both utopian characteristics and dystopian characteristics. So it's a cool time to be alive. And um, when Starhawk wrote this book, I think she was ahead of her time in predicting some of the things that would start to emerge in this kind of revolution of consciousness that we have, and perhaps predicting on the downside some of the division and some of the conflict that we're seeing internally and the strife that we're seeing on the dystopian side. But it's a magnificent book, so I'm excited to present it to you for AMP Books number 5, The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk. And this episode of Amp Books is brought to you by On It. And so when you want to nestle up with a nice fiction like this, you might want to have some coffee. And sometimes when you really want to have like the most coffee and do it the most, you have Fuck Yeah Coffee. And that's the new collaboration we have with Black Rifle Coffee. It's amazing. It's extra caffeine. It tastes great. And it's something that just kicks it up a little notch. You can still mix it with all your favorite goodies just like regular coffee, just with caffeine crystals added, and it's dope. So it's all back in stock, and if you're interested, I encourage you guys to definitely try it. All right, so the reading I'm about to enter into uh, takes place in chapter 26 of the book, and it involves the heroine, whose name is Madrone, who comes from the utopian society that lives in the north. And she has traveled down this dry, arid landscape to find a band of rebels that are working against the dystopian society. And one of the people she encountered when she first encountered this band of rebels was a man named Hijon. And she had a sexual encounter with Hijon. And during that encounter, she was able to teach Hijon some of the lovemaking techniques that they learn in the North. And then subsequently, she met Hijon's other lover, his regular lover, whose name was Katie. And Katie is carrying Hijon's baby. So Madrone had a sexual affair with Katie's man, whose name is Hijon. And now in this scene, Madrone for the first time gets to talk to Katie about the experience, who, as you might expect, is none too pleased. Katie, I'm sorry, she said. I really, truly, honestly didn't know how hurt you'd be by this. Didn't you? Katie's eyes were black sparks in the dark. Or didn't you care? Katie, I'm from a different place, a different world. Maybe I should have stopped to think it out, but it never occurred to me that what we did could hurt you. Don't lie to me, Madrone. That just makes it worse. I'm not lying. Now don't get mad, Madrone told herself. If you get pulled into her anger, you'll cut the last cord that swings across this gap and she'll be alone on the other side with the baby coming. And you'll be alone, here with all your skills, unable to help. Katie, please, I'm asking you to try to believe me. Or if not believe, at least imagine that I might be telling you the truth. I didn't know. 
I would never willingly have done something to hurt you. She stopped because there were corollaries she didn't wish to pursue. Hi, John had known how hurt Katie would be, and it hadn't stopped him, which was, Madrone suspected, the real source of Katie's pain. Hi, John is a man, Katie said, as if she were following Madrone's thoughts, and the best of them are all the same when it comes to sex. But women ought to stick together. There's a lifetime of assumptions here, Madrone thought. Assumptions I don't share and can't even identify. She felt tired, suddenly. Too tired to argue. I am alone now, she thought. Katie was as close as I had to a friend here, and now that's gone. Hi, John, was as close as I've come to a lover in a long while, and he's cut off too. Now that I know how you feel, I would never do it again, Madrone said. It's not like we're going to carry it on or threaten what you and he have. It was just one moment, an impulse. I was scared, Katie. I needed comfort, and he responded. That's the problem with you, Madrone. Everything you need, you think you have a right to reach for and take. Every impulse you have, you follow. You get an impulse to have sex, you have sex. You're like some animal. That's not fair. Anyway, it doesn't matter to me whether you carry on or not. I'm through with him. You've changed him. And now you've poisoned what we had. I'll always feel you in the midst of our lovemaking if we ever do it again. Ah, Madrone thought. There's a slight contradiction here. She's through with him yet still thinking about making love with him. Maybe there's hope. Because they need each other so much in this place where love is as scarce as water. I would really hate to think I've wrecked what they had together. Do you have to take it that way? Madrone asked, her voice very low and neutral. Can't you take it as a gift? Don't be patronizing. I just mean that every new lover expands the range of our possibilities, we say. That's sick. Love is a feeling, a commitment, not a a craft. A little skill doesn't hurt. Maybe I liked him the way he was. Katie, you couldn't have, honestly. How can you say that? What do you know about me or what I want? I know anatomy. You're just being insulting. (sighs) I will try one more time, Madrone thought, and then let it go. Katie, listen to the blessing we say to our lovers on Beltane Eve. My love, you are a river fed by many streams. I bless all who have shaped you. The lovers whose delights still dance patterns on your back. Those who carved your channels deeper, broader, wider, Whitewater and backwater lovers, swamp lovers, sun-warmed estuary lovers, lovers with surface tension, lovers like boulders, like ice forming and breaking, lovers that fill and spill with the tides. I bless those who have taught you, and those who have pleased you, and those who have hurt you, all those who have made you who you are. Now I know I'm glad to be a Christian, Katie said. So there it is. There's really what we as a society have as the traditional viewpoint expressed by Katie. Someone sleeps with your man, you've ruined him, you've tainted him, you know, and that's part of the problem that we have with all current affairs. But it's also a problem that most of us have with past affairs. I mean, I've been caught in this same position. I've been Katie so many times where a lover that I've had, I don't even want to think about the past lovers, let alone dare to imagine that they taught them something or that they were potentially better at something than me or enhanced their skills, which is exactly what Madrone did coming from a utopian society, meeting High John from these rebel lands 
and teaching him some of the advanced lovemaking skills and connection techniques that they had developed and cultivated as part of a society that operated in the most conscious way. In that utopian society, making love was just part of the fabric of how you expressed yourself, both in a relationship and in the context of the community as a whole. And whether you were gay or bi or straight or you had many lovers or you just had one lover, all was the choice that you had the option to accept and really express yourself and lean into in this utopian society. And I think that's the place where really I see the invitation for all of us to go to, a place where we don't have to put ourselves in these boxes that are really just the momentum of a history of conditioning. And as Katie mentions in her retort, a lot of this comes from religious conditioning. And not only that, but there's just cultural conditioning everywhere we look. So that we look at every former lover or every current lover as a threat, as a detriment. And it's this obsession with the virgin that we've expressed in so many ways through so many different cultures, even from antiquity, right? It's like you want the untainted one. But in the utopian viewpoint, why would you want the untainted one when you could have someone who's learned and grown and evolved from every single lover they had? And that's why they have that blessing that's part of a holiday in which they actively go and bless every single lover that their lovers have had because that's what shaped them that's what made your lover whoever your lover might be that's what made them who they are like even the ones that hurt them that's hard you know i remember all of the times that i've been with a new lover and it's never pleasant or at least it never was pleasant for me to hear about their past sexual experiences, but the ones that were bad, whoa, those got me really fired up. Those got me really angry. You know, but if I look back at my own life, you know, even my own bad relationships or even the challenging times in my relationship with my father, like all of those were opportunities for me to learn, to grow, to adapt, to become stronger. Like those made me who I am. So if I came to any lover that I currently have, without having any of those experiences, both the good ones, the ones that taught me things, the ones that pleased me, and the ones that hurt me, I wouldn't be a fraction of who I am. And neither would the person that you're with. So it's an opportunity to reframe all of that as a blessing. And also reframe these ideas about men and women. And that's also another thing that comes up in this passage about this idea that ah, just men just have sex with whatever, but women, we got to stick together. And it's this really kind of antagonistic viewpoint and putting people in these stereotypes that don't really need to apply. And look, this whole idea and this framework is challenging and it's hard. And I'm telling you, I've been Katie so many fucking times, you know, and found myself so jealous, so triggered, so hurt by different experiences that I've had in my open relationship with Whitney. And I can think back to all of these moments where you know, I've been in this same place where I still, like Katie, still wants Hi John. I still wanted Whitney and I still wanted to do it, but I was so hurt that it was hard for me to see beyond that. And that's part of the learning process and part of what I'm so grateful for in my own open relationship experience was my ability to learn some of these lessons and get a little better. And now, am I fully, you know, fully like Madrone and can never get jealous and I don't feel these things anymore? Of course not. You know, it's a process. But imagining a culture, you know, on the utopian scale where this is reinforced and this is part of the conditioning and everybody around you and all your friends are like, yeah, well, that helped teach them these things. And it was all about learning. You know, like Ramdas says, the soul is here to learn. Like the person is here to learn too. The, the lover is here to learn. And without other lovers, like how do you learn all the things that you're capable of learning? And so I think that's the invitation. And it's not saying that this is some invitation that all of us need to accept and this is the only way. But all of us, pretty much everyone, has a lover that had had past lovers. And how are we mentally, at the very least, going to look at them? 
Are we going to look at them as things we don't want to think about, things that we're regretful for, wishing they were this untainted, unstained virgin that we met them with? No, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. They wouldn't be who they are. They wouldn't be the person that we love. They wouldn't be the person that we love making love to. So regardless of your relationship construct, which I believe that all of these relationship constructs can work, doesn't even matter what the construct is. You can still look at everything that's happened in the past as a blessing, as part of what shaped the current person you're with. And I think that's the beauty of a novel like this is because it takes two different ideals, ideals that represent something that we see every day in our own society and imagines what it could be like if you had a culture and a society that was much different. And in this book and then in the following sequel, they really go into detail about the sexual education process and this is something that aldous huxley does in the book island as well because we're so backwards with this we like look at sex and lovemaking as this taboo thing when it's one of the most important things in any of our lives like what do we talk about with our friends most often i don't know like our relationships are making love and and all of the things that are involved in that but yet Culturally, we're still so taboo. We have maybe porn on this side, and then maybe we have a few Tantra books on this side, but it's not really a part of our regular learning, our regular education, and there's not really a place that you can easily and accessibly go to to start to get this kind of information. And hopefully that's something that's changing. And I really look forward to that process, and it's happening. You know, I think that's, my you know former partner whitney i think that's her purpose with coming out with so much of the information she has on the true sex and wild love podcast i think dr wednesday martin in her book untrue it's just about reframing all of the different things that we think about sexuality and giving us the opportunity to just look at it from a slightly different lens and if we look at it from that different lens we might be able to alchemize some of these hurtful painful feelings and actually be grateful for those And that makes a huge difference, again, regardless of whatever relationship you choose. So that's why I love reading utopian fiction, especially this book, The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk, and of course, Aldous Huxley's Island, which will be featured in Ant Books for sure coming up. And to just imagine what it could be like if things were a little bit different. And I think this is a great example of that and uh, a great passage. And I really love that blessing. And it's something that I've gone back to and read and reread and help to remind myself because it's something that's challenging when we live in a world that's conditioned in a much different way. So I hope you enjoyed the passage and I encourage you guys to check out the book because there's a lot of really beautiful ideas about consciousness, about relationship, about how to organize and structure society, about sustainability, about all kinds of environmental policies and government policies. It's really a beautiful example of what it could be if we elevated our thinking to a different perspective. So thanks for tuning in to Ant Books. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.